Good morning again, family. I agree with Mark's prayer. We don't know the half of it. And I get to come up here and try and explain it all to you. <laughs> so if any of you wants to come up instead, that'd be great. Uh, we start with a little fun first. My wardrobe is not a statement on anything here today. <laughs> no, you're used to seeing the tie and the suit. It's a statement on my wardrobe. I get up this morning and I've decided I didn't want to wear long sleeves. So I went in my closet to get short sleeve dress shirt. I realized I only had two. One of them looked like I slept in it last night. The other one I went to put it on, and I don't know if you know this, but apparently it's possible for a shirt to shrink just around the neck. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that was possible. So a little difficult to get on. So this is not a comment on any dress code, okay? <laughs> it's a statement on my wardrobe. So I could use a personal shopper. I know some of you might be interested in that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to discuss is I think we have, we have anyone here who's here for the very first time ever in life. Never been here once before. Oh, you, am I the only one that knew he was coming? <laughs> This, uh, this young man's name is Braden. I just, one of the important things about being a speaker is being welcoming. And I just wanted to welcome you. I wanted to make sure everyone knew you were here. He's sitting next to Sonia, there's a reason. So just welcome Braden later today. And by the way, she's daddy's little girl, so be careful. All right. There's another young lady sitting over here. Her name's Carla. I never did that to her, but you can say hi to Carla. Raise your hand, Carla. Should I do you next? <laughs> this is Mike and Faye have been coming for a couple weeks. This is actually my boss. Are you my boss? <laughs> Welcome then. That's Mike and Faye. Oh. Just want to be a welcoming guest speaker here. <laughs> so um, if your relationship with God doesn't include a little bit of fun, you need to reevaluate. Bonus mini sermon. Are you okay if we do things a little different today? Okay. Relax, I'm not going to sit the whole time, just breathe. All right. I just wanted to start, and the reason I'm sitting, one of the challenges of being an effective communicator is knowing what to speak, when to speak, and putting it all together in a way that keeps you awake. Um, but one of the things that we don't maybe think about too much is how much to share. Because for someone like me who's willing to share his whole heart, sometimes you can stick your foot in your mouth and say things you shouldn't. Um, but I also think at times that this I also think at times it helps you to know where I'm at so that you can frame what we're about to talk about and also so that you know where I'm coming from so you can gauge the information I'm giving you if it's accurate or not. Um, so if I want to, I just want to give you a little peek behind the curtain and how the sausage is made here before we get into the sermon. So I'm not really sure how these things come about. I'll sit down one day and I'll open this and I'll read it. And it's like the Lord just gives me this insight into it. Like two, three, four, five points will come out of a, a section of scripture that I read. And I quick open the notes app on my phone and I jot those four or five points down. And I go, wow, I never saw that before. And then because I have so long to speak in between times, I don't have to do this every week. In the coming weeks or months, I'll just fill in between each point with an anecdote or other scripture so that I make sure we're not getting too far off track. And I'll use my reference Bible. Because one of the things that's really important to me is that whatever I say up here is true. Because scripture is very clear that if I'm teaching and whoever's teaching, you're judged more harshly for that. So it can be very it's very important to me that what we say is true. It's also very mentally taxing because you, you're 
constantly looking for and making sure and redoing it to make sure it's true. I'm sure Jay's back there nodding his head. He understands. And originally this message was no different. Okay, so sometime at the end of last year, or I want to say in January sometime, I read the passage of scripture we're going to go over. And I immediately had these three thoughts, these three points came to mind. I wrote them down. I quick opened my phone, put them in, and, and I was really excited about it. I was, I was like, man, this is really good. And the Lord even gave me this inclination that it was for certain people who might be here today. And I went back the next time I was supposed to speak to look for it, and it was gone. I couldn't find it. I didn't know where it went. And not only that, but I couldn't remember the points that I actually wrote down. I remembered like some of them, but it didn't make sense then, and it just didn't come together. And so I kind of took that as a sign that, okay, we'll put this on the back burner for later. So fast forward to this week, and honestly, Monday, I had no idea what I was going to talk to you about. None whatsoever, and that's abnormal. I, I normally have something to at least start with. There are a couple different ideas rolling around in my head, but I, I, none of them felt right. And if I'm honest with you, it, and here's where it's a little bit of a testimony. If I'm honest with you, this week's been a mess. Not in the physical sense. Work is fine. Family's fine. Brooke has a little fever this morning. You can pray for her, but not in the physical sense. But, but mentally. And I think some of us, a lot of us might feel this way because of the coronavirus. We're all looking at all this information day in and day out and trying to figure out what's true and what's not true. And it's taxing mentally. And then you throw on top of that, now we've got all the, pol the political stuff going on because the election's coming. So you've got political ads, you've got conspiracy theories, you've got all this stuff you're trying to sort through so you can be an informed, accurate, registered voter. You want to be diligent about what you do. So all this is going on. And I don't think I'm unique in this way. I think a lot of you probably feel mentally taxed right now. But at the same time, I'm trying to prepare a message. And in my personal life, I'm also, over the last several weeks, been wrestling with God on certain ideas and principles from his word about how he interacts with us in this world. And it's, it came to a forefront and a, a kind of a head lately. Uh, and all this to say it's all happening while I'm trying to put this message together. So that's a long way of telling you that I'm exhausted mentally. Physically, I think I'm okay. I don't want to help you move today, but I could do it. I think it lends itself perfectly, that testimony, to the scripture we're going to look at today. Because maybe all that happened in my life for a purpose, for timing. And maybe there's people here today who needed to hear what we're going to talk about. But that's how we ended up here today. So if you want to join me, turn to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. A little background on what we're doing here. Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau. You probably all know it, but I'll go over it quickly. Jacob and Esau were born twins together. Uh, at some point later in life, Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a meal. Jacob, quote unquote, stole his blessing from his father, which made Esau very angry. He wanted to kill him. So God told Jacob, get out of here. He went to live with his uncle Laban. He met his wife, Rebecca, also had to marry Leah. Remember that whole story? He does some more things that irritate his uncle's son, so now they are angry at him. So God says to Jacob, you know what? It's time to go back home. Time to go back home. And that's where we're picking up the story here. Verse 3, Jacob, Jacob sent messengers ahead to his brother Esau, who was living in the region of Seir in the land of Edom. Edom, Edom. He told them, Give this message to my master Esau. Humble greetings from your servant Jacob. Until now, I've been living with Uncle Laban. And now, I own cattle, donkeys, flocks of sheep and goats, and many servants, both men and women. I have sent these messengers to inform my Lord of my coming, hoping that you will be friendly to me. After delivering the message, the messengers returned to Jacob and reported, 
We met your brother Esau, and he is already on his way to meet you with an army of 400 men. Jacob was terrified at the news. Remember, his brother had wanted to kill him. He divided his household, along with the flocks and herds and camels, into two groups. He thought, if Esau meets one group and attacks it, perhaps the other one can escape. Then Jacob prayed. Then Jacob prayed. Then Jacob prayed. O God of my grandfather Abraham and God of my father Isaac, Lord, you told me, return to your own land and to your relatives. And you promised me, I will treat you kindly. I'm not worthy of all the unfailing love and faithfulness you have shown me, your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I owned nothing except a walking stick. Now my household fills two large camps. Oh, Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. I'm afraid that he is coming to attack me along with my wives and children. But you promised me I will surely treat you kindly, and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands on the seashore, too many to count. Jacob stayed there where he was for the night, and he selected gifts from his possessions to present to his brother Esau. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 female camels, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. He divided these animals into herds and assigned each to different servants. Then he told his servants, go ahead of me with the animals, but keep some distance between the herds. He gave these instructions to men leading the first group. When my brother Esau meets you, he will ask, whose servants are you? Where are you going? Who owns these animals? You must reply, they belong to your servant Jacob, but they are a gift for his master Esau. Look, he is coming right behind us. Jacob gave the same instructions to the second and third herdsmen and to all who followed behind the herds. You must say the same thing to Esau when you meet him, and be sure to say, look, your servant Jacob is right behind us. Jacob thought, I will try to appease him by sending gifts ahead of me. When I see him in person, perhaps he will be friendly to me. So the gifts were sent on ahead while Jacob himself spent the night in the camp. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives and his two servant wives and his 11 sons, and they crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them on the other side, he sent all his possessions over. This left Jacob all alone in camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. Then the man said, let me go, for dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name, the man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel, because you have fought with God and men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you need to know my name, the man replied. And then he blessed Jacob there. So... As I was mentally wrestling with God, I thought maybe some of you have had your time wrestling with God, where you found yourself doing that. And if you're, how many of you have done that? How many of you have wrestled with God? Only one. Four? Six? Come on. Seven? All right. Well, if you're like me and you ask that question, I'd mutter under my breath every day. Jacob found himself wrestling with God here, and I think his story gives us some insights on the idea of wrestling with God and what we can expect when that happens. And the first thing is that not, not always, but oftentimes, it will happen at inconvenient times. God will come to wrestle with you at inconvenient times. Jacob just got done moving his entire family in the middle of the night across a river. Now, I'm not sure what they had for bridges in that day, but I'm guessing this wasn't an easy task to get his whole family and all his possessions across the river. He probably had servants to help him, but I'm guessing he did some of the work too. Likely it wasn't an easy thing. It's the middle of the night. It's bedtime. He comes back to camp. He's physically tired. We know he's mentally tired because he's worried about being killed by his brother. And yet now, now is the time when God comes to wrestle with him. That seems a little inconvenient. I want to go back to Jacob's prayer for a minute. In verse 9, he says, you, re you told me to return to your own land, and I will treat you kindly. So Jacob knows that the commandments that God gave him, and he also knows the promises God made him in his word. 
Jacob is aware of what God said to him, and yet it still doesn't stop him from fearing for his life. Why? Why? The first thing is God, God's promises don't always give us smooth sailing. God's promises don't lead to smooth sailing. In verse 10, Jacob had been blessed. He started out with just a walking stick. That's it. Now he has enough for two camps. But now that blessing is being threatened. God has promised us eternal life. Our lives and our hope and everything have been forever changed if we know Jesus. Right? Oh, I got an amen. Donna. You know what else God promised us in John 16, 33? In this life, you will have trouble. Jacob is finding this out. He's finding it out. God, the second thing is God's promises don't always look the way we think they should. They don't always look the way we think they should. I don't need to tell any of you that God probably doesn't do things the way that you would do them. Thank Jesus for that. Right? I'm glad he doesn't do it. The way, there was a time I didn't want children. I'm glad he changed that. Absolutely thrilled that he changed that. Jacob is not a particular fan of God's plan at this point of his life. And what this leads to is questions on Jacob's part. What's going on, God? What's happening right now? Is God actually sending him home to die at his brother's hand? Is that the plan? What's up with that? The same thing happens on our part. Inevitably, we wrestle with God because we know he has answers that we want, and we don't have them. And sometimes we know the answers, and we just don't like them. <laughs> sometimes we know them, and we just don't like them. But this is why we wrestle with God. We, we understand what God has promised us. We understand his character, but it doesn't match up with what we see right in front of us. This doesn't, no, this don't work together. This doesn't work together. It's not the way we would do things. I believe what we're seeing here is a physical manifestation of what's going on in Jacob's spiritual life, right? He's wrestling with God. The same thing happens to us in all our lives, often at the most inconvenient time. Someone close to us dies. All right? Our kids get sick. We see starving people or senseless violence. We lose a boatload of money. We lose our jobs. And we say, God, I don't, this, this, this doesn't make any sense. And it's then that the wrestling begins. And, and perhaps there's a reason for that, which leads us to point coming I mean, to wrestling with God will change you. Wrestling with God will change you. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. And the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. So when the man saw that he would not win, when the man saw that he would not win, what does that mean? There's a period of time that had to come in there. It wasn't immediate. The guy didn't just engage him and say, oh, I'm not going to win this match. No, there was a period of time. It took all night. In other words, wrestling matches are not generally a short affair. When you wrestle with God, don't expect it to be done in a couple hours or a day. That can happen. But my experience, it usually takes weeks. When the man saw he would not win, he wrenched Jacob's hip out of socket. In other words, Jacob was never the same after that. He was permanently changed from wrestling with God, permanently changed. You've heard some older World War II or, or Korean War veterans, Vietnam War veterans, they come home and they share war stories or what's called war stories. You know, a certain period of time goes by after they come back from battle. And after, after that period of healing occurs, they'll start to discuss their scars or they'll have a piece of shrapnel, and they'll tell their war stories. It's, it's a, a moment in time or a particular thing that happened to them that they have a memento of. It has a particular connotation attached to it. It's something they never forget. 
the battle changed them. And Jacob's battle with God changed him forever. When someone asks Jacob, why are you limping? He can say, because I wrestled with the Lord, and here's what he taught me about it. Our spiritual marks may not be visible, but we probably remember them very well. When I was a new Christian, I would say I was no more than two or three years new, which would make me in my early 20s. I was the lone college and career kid at my small church, probably about this size, and so I guess they felt sorry for me. They invited me to a youth weekend retreat. <clears throat> and because I was a working individual, I had to drive separately. So it was in Tioga County, way up north. It's probably, what, three hours from here maybe? So we go to this weekend youth retreat, and on Saturday night, <clears throat> there's a hay ride with no hay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tractor attached to about an 18-foot flatbed wagon. <clears throat> so we're all sitting on the wagon with our legs swinging off the end and doing what youth do, whatever. <clears throat> so we're going up through fields and this and that, and when we have to turn around, we go out on this small little two-lane road. <clears throat> it's not a lot of traffic in Tioga County. So tractor goes out. Well, in the meantime, a pickup truck was coming toward us. And so we're in this lane, and he's coming at us, and we're not really paying attention. Next thing you know, the pickup truck sideswipes the wagon. It actually grazed my foot because I was toward the back, so it actually bounced off the middle and, and off the back. And it grazed my foot, and it ripped six or seven kids off the wagon. And one of them ended up under the wheel of the wagon. The wagon, the tractor guy had stopped, but not before he was on top of one of the kids, probably 12 years old. And the guy kept going. The pickup truck just kept going. So amongst the yelling and screaming and hollering, they backed the wagon off the kid. We get an ambulance there. He did turn out to be fine. The cops did catch the guy who hit us. He was drunk driving. But you can imagine when we go back to camp that night, and Pastor did as great a job as he could at answering all of our questions. But for a young Christian to sit and go through all this, how many questions run through your mind, right? I get in my car to go home on Sunday, and, and like I said, Pastor answered as many questions as he could, but God and I had it out on the way home. You know, you put your Christian music CD in, you know what CDs are, and you're singing on the way home, and all of a sudden it's just like, no, this doesn't make sense. And, and I'm talking to God out loud. We're having it out, yelling crying. It's not always a bad thing, crying. By the way, if I can read Hosea, Hosea talks about this incident with Jacob. It's Hosea chapter 12 and verse 3. He says, even in the womb, Jacob struggled with his brother. When he became a man, he even fought with God. He wrestled with the angel and won. He wept. He wept and pleaded for a blessing from him. You're allowed to weep. There's no shame in crying. This isn't baseball. But some point, some point on that three-hour ride home, I decided that even though I don't understand it all, I'm not going to let go of the things that I know to be true for the things I don't understand, which leads us to point three. Uh, bonus mini-sermon. Always get a bonus mini-sermon, right? Thomas Henry's commentary on this says, it's possible Jacob was wounded and healed at the same time. Never thought about that. But he says it never mentions that Jacob cried out. It never mentions that he was laid up for a while. His hip was wrenched out of socket, and yet he just goes on with life the next day. I wonder if God does that to us. Does he wound us and heal us at the same time? For example, holding on to something too tightly in your life, so he takes it away. It seems like he's wounding you, but at the same time he's healing you from holding on to something you shouldn't be. Just an idea. That's your bonus mini-sermon. Point number three, winning with God is not letting go. <laughs> Back to our text. I will not let you go unless you bless me, Jacob says. What is your name, the man asks. He said, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel, which means God fights. 
because you have fought with God and men and have won. How, Mark just talked about the throne room of God and the imagery. How do you have a wrestling match with that God and win? How do you do that? It says he won. If I have a wrestling match with Brooke, my five-year-old daughter, is there any way she's going to win? Donna's shaking her head no. I can think of two ways. I let her. That's one. What's the other way? If she's persistent, maybe I'll just give up. If two hours of five-year-old energy makes 42-year-old dad a little tired, I might just give in, right? I'm probably going to give up even though I know I could keep going and end it in about a second. We know we aren't wrestling with God to defeat God. That's not the purpose, right? So what is the point? Winning with God is about being persistent. It's about persevering. See, believe it or not, the time you're spending with God, even wrestling with him, is growing your intimacy with him, is growing your respect and your relationship for each other. How many of you married people know about this, right? No, but no amens? I got no amens on that. Come on. I know I should have got one amen at least out of that. The same principle applies here. So you, you, you're, you're with your married spouse, and over the, the course of 1, 10, 40, 50 years, your relationship grows stronger because you've been through the ringer together. You've had it out a couple times. It's just the way it is. And you made it out the other side with a stronger relationship. The same principle applies here. You know, when Adam and Eve failed in the garden, it was because they were convinced that something other than what God's word said was true. Jacob is wrestling here because what he sees in the immediate future of his life doesn't match up with what God promised him, what was in his word. And how many times do our lives feel that way? It's not a new phenomenon. From very day one, rest, the idea of wrestling with God's word has been a thing. When it's our time to get in the ring, winning is, not about, winning is about not letting go of God's word even when it doesn't make sense to us. And also, please notice something. It doesn't say that Jacob winning meant he got assurance that the next day was going to go well. He still didn't know how it was going to go with Esau. He won that fight and still didn't know how it was going to go the next day. And it doesn't mean he got the answers to all of his questions about God's plan. It does say he was blessed. It doesn't say how, but it does say he was blessed. So what does that mean for us? When difficult times come, it may be our greatest opportunity for growth and blessing. even if it doesn't feel that way at the time. You know, wrestlers have a choice when they step out onto the mat. When, when a wrestler gets onto the mat to fight, if things aren't going the way they like, they can tap out. Everyone heard tapping out? Who knows what tapping out means? If, if you're in a hold that you can't get out of, if you can't breathe, if something's not going right and you just want to quit, you tap the mat and the referee knows it's over. You can tap out. When the questions come and we're wrestling with God, that is an option. We can tap out. We can tap out. Quitting is an option. It's not a good one, but it's an option. And it's happened. Let me read you a story from John. John chapter 6 and verse 53. Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man... And drink his blood. You cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I'll raise that person on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The word of God, by the way. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. I live because of the living father who has sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, but they will live forever. He said these things while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. 
Many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. He's talking about eating flesh and drinking blood. This is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining, so he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you don't believe me. Then he said, that is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. They tapped out. No, I can't. Nah. Tapping out. Jesus turned to the twelve and said, are you also going to leave? Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. See, we can tap out if we want to. But see, you also need to answer that question, to whom are you going to go? For me, I'm with Peter and Jacob. The words of eternal life are here, even if they get hard for me to understand. I'm going to hold on until I win, whenever that may be. What about you? Are you willing to hold on to, the, to that blessing at the end? Or do you want to tap out? It's not easy all the time. So if you're struggling to hold on, we're here for you as a family. If you want prayer about a specific issue, please come up front while, while Mark's playing. We're going to sing a song. Someone on the prayer team will be up here to pray with you. Consider it a tag team match. Please, don't give up. Don't tap out. If Jacob can win wrestling with God, so can you, and so can I.